So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Angela J. Ketty. I'm the OMF's or the Open Mobility Foundation's member engagement manager. Um, nice to see so many of our members here um, and welcome to folks who uh, might be new to who we are and what we do. Um, today we are going to be exploring the topics of mobility data and open standards as they relate to um, transportation policy goals like sustainability, equity, safety, things like that. Um, specifically, we're gonna be talking about how the new federal administration can leverage strides that cities have made in this space, um, and as, as well as um, how cities can support federal goals. So given the topics that we're going to be discussing, I wanted to set up the panel with a little bit of background about um, the OMF and what we do. Then we're going to move into a panel discussion um, with time at the end for audience Q&A. So if you have any questions throughout any point in the webinar, um, please use Zoom's Q&A feature. You should see it at the bottom of your screen. There's two little conversation bubbles um, and you can ask questions there. You can also upvote questions um, and comment on questions. So let's get started. Um, it's no secret that our transportation systems um, are changing rapidly, incorporating more and more digitally enabled ways of moving around. So think ride sharing, shared e-scooters and bikes, autonomous vehicles, even delivery robots. Um, and as these services play a bigger role in our lives, cities need new ways of ensuring that everyone has their transportation needs met in a safe, equitable and environmentally sustainable way, terms that you'll hear um, often throughout this conversation. So the Open Mobility Foundation is a nonprofit um, that provides scalable mobility solutions for cities to address those needs. We are a city-led membership organization that brings together public agencies and private sector stakeholders, so a public-private partnership, um, to create tools in an open source environment. Um, which means that we build freely available tools that are developed through a transparent collaborative process that's open source. Primarily, we manage a tool called the Mobility Data Spe Specification, or MDS for short. Um, at its core, MDS is a set of APIs that create standardized two-way communications for cities and private companies to share information about their operations, um, and that allow cities to collect data that can inform infrastructure planning, regulations, and other public policy decisions, which we'll get to in a sec. Um, but because I am often the least technical person in the room these days, I like to use analogies for describing MDS. Um, and my favorite being the concept of a digital plumbing layer as shown in this diagram. Um, MDS is used in more than 20 cities around the world to plan transportation infrastructure, support and regulate shared mobility services, and advance these goals that will, again, um, that will keep coming up, safety, equitable transportation systems, and sustainable transportation systems. Um, MDS was originally developed to help manage dockless micromobility programs, um, including dockless e-scooters, but it's also used in free floating car and bike share programs, delivery robots, and other emerging modes. Um, and the OMF is even starting to tackle issues around curve management using the same approach. As we begin this conversation around mobility data, open source projects, data standards, et cetera, um, I wanna leave you with two um, examples of how MDS is being used in the real world. Um, this is kind of what brings it to life. So first, to measure the impact of infrastructure investments. Um, this is an example coming from Portland, which is one of our member cities. Um, and you can see that there is a multi-use path, multi path on the waterfront that e-scooters are um, not allowed to ride on. You can see that in red, uh, this waterfront park path. Um, yet data demonstrated that it was the most frequently ridden place in the city. Um, so the city took on the construction of a two-way bike lane dubbed Better NATO, um, running parallel to the waterfront. You can see that in, um, in blue. And they also added geofencing and educational signage to um, increase use of that. And you can see here that this led to a significant decrease in ridership along the um, prohibited waterfront path and a significant increase in ridership along NATO Parkway. 
Um, and again, this is all possible using MDS, measuring this is possible using MDS. Next, um, an equity analysis from Chicago, another one of our member cities. Um, as many of you might be familiar with, cities often set up these um, geographic equity zones or priority areas to ensure um, that shared e-scooters are available in lower income neighborhoods um, or other areas of interest. So <clears throat> the chart here shows that availability in Chicago's priority areas was higher in the morning um, as fleets were set up for morning commutes. But later in the day, presumably as riders are taking these vehicles to different areas, um, and as operators are rebalancing fleets, there's less availability in those priority areas versus the rest of the pilot area. Um, and again, this is measured using MDS. So if you want to learn more about our work, um, including a variety of other use cases for MDS, uh, more information about how to get involved, um, our membership, et cetera, I invite you to connect with us in all of the places, um, whether that's GitHub or Twitter or check out our website. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's panel so that they can dig into these topics in more detail um, and talk about the kind of relationship between um, city and federal government when it comes to these transportation policies. So moderating our panel today um, is Gabe Klein. He's a partner at CityFi and VP at Fontanales Partners. Um, Gabe has spent his career as an entrepreneur, both in the private sector and in government. He is the former commissioner of the Chicago and Washington DC Departments of Transportation, um, as well as an alum of Zipcar, Bikes USA, and even ran his own electric powered organic food truck chain. Um, these days he advises governments and companies across the world um, on leveraging technology and taking innovative approaches to produce the best possible outcomes for people. Joining Gabe on the panel um, is the Honorable Stephen Benjamin, who has been serving as the mayor of Columbia, South Carolina for 10 plus years. Um, in addition to serving as mayor, he's also served as the president of the US Conference of Mayors, is a member of the Accelerator for America Advisory Council, co-chair of the Mayors for 100% Clean Energy Campaign amongst many other leadership roles. Um, next joining us um, from the Open Mobility Foundation is our own executive director, Yasha Franklin Hodge. Um, prior to leading the OMF, Yasha served as Boston's chief information officer, co-founded Blue State Digital, um, and has been a visiting fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School, specifically focused on the issues of mobility, technology, and public policy. Um, last, we have Michael Shapiro, the US Department of Transportation's Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for Economic Policy. Prior to the Department of Transportation, Michael was Vice President at Sidewalk Infrastructure Partners, served as Economic Policy Advisor for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign, Senior Policy Advisor at the White House National Economic Council in the Obama administration, um, and also held various roles at the Office of Management and Budget, the Council of Economic Advisors, and the Treasury Department. So let's give a virtual round of applause to our panel. Um, feel free to use the chat feature for any non-panelist question related conversation. Uh, you can even use it for your emoji applause, um, but I'll hand it over to Gabe from here. Um, and thank you to our panelists so much for joining us. Awesome, thanks Angela. Uh, this is one of those great times where I get to be the least esteemed uh, uh, panelist in my uh, circle of panelists here. So that, that's great. And uh, wonderful as always to uh, see Yasha and, and Mayor Benjamin and welcome uh, Michael. I think we might've met once uh, a while ago uh, when you were at, at Sidewalk uh, Infrastructure Partners. So I'm, I've been really excited about this conversation and I think um, we should start sort of broad and, uh, and then maybe get a little more detailed and uh, you know, feel free to break in, chime in, uh, cut me off, tell me I'm wrong. Um, but, uh, you know, thinking like at a very high level, uh, how local and federal uh, levels of government can support each other in achieving transportation policy goals, shared transportation policy goals. We definitely want people to share more, right? So they have to make a big investment. So whether it's equity, as Angela said, sustainability, economic recovery, which is crucial right now. Um, you know, what kinds of data are required to help people reach those goals? And I would open it up 
to all of you. I mean, we could start maybe with 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 Yasha uh, because you think about this all day. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Gabe, uh, and uh, great to be here with uh, my fellow panelists, and and thanks for everybody uh, for tuning into this. Um, I mean, I think there's you know this sort of potential universe of data that's that's useful in these goals is very broad and very vast. Um, but I think it's helpful to sort of maybe start by just framing what the role of cities is in achieving some of these bigger picture goals. Um, you know, so often, right, you kind of, we, we think of different layers of government as operating in their own separate spheres. But when you talk about some of these big um, and really, really crucial uh, objectives that have been articulated by um, the, the new Secretary of Transportation and the administration as a whole, right, cities are going to play a critical role in bringing some of those things to life. You know, so whether it's thinking about um, you know, how we make buses work better for the people that they serve through space allocation and better bus stops, whether it's designing complete streets that encourage uh, safer, more sustainable uh, types of transportation, welcoming shared mobility options into cities and creating the space and regulatory environment for them to thrive. Um, there's a, a ton of, uh, uh, you know, issues around zoning and land use that cities control, but which have huge impacts on the transportation system, you know, parking requirements, transit oriented development, um, all of these things really kind of uh, live within the, the realm of the city and even things like electrification, you know, how does, how do we, if, if so we try to electrify, you know, uh, traditional vehicles, you know, what, what are the, what are the physical infrastructure investments that need to happen. So I think it's sort of important to kind of ground the discussion in the ways that cities can and, and must be partners with the federal government and with other layers of government to achieve some of these bigger goals. Um, you know, overall, I think you know, we can, I'm sure we're going to get into some of the specific types of data, but ultimately, I would, I would guess, maybe answer your question by saying, you know, cities need um, to be able to understand what's happening on their streets and to be able to use that knowledge to adapt and iterate the policies that they put forth. I think if we look at the scale and scope of change that is going to be necessary in our transportation system in the coming decades, especially to deal with climate change, but so many other issues, it's absolutely like nobody has the answer going into that. There's no crystal ball for that. But in lieu of a crystal ball, the best thing you can have is really good data and a culture of sort of testing and learning and iteration. And so I think we're going to start to see sources about you know, modal usage for new services and modes about the ways in which infrastructure investments shift behavior, uh, about the kind of economic impacts that come from some of the changes that are being proposed. Uh, the more and faster we can measure those things and use that to adapt our policies, the faster we're going to get to some of the goals that we've laid out. Yeah, no, great, great points. Because it's really about, it's about shaping a lot of the change that's happening outside of government and working together amongst the different layers of government than it is making the change always yourself. Um, mayor Benjamin, you're a, you're a mayor, you deal with this every day and you've thought a lot about this. Uh, what are your thoughts? First of all, I wanna apologize. Usually I'm, I'm in, I've sequestered my daughter's piano room and I have all the flags behind me and I, I've, I've stolen her, her ring light that she uses to make TikTok videos and I'm already I'm in, I'm in a sterile office right now, uh, trying my best to, to, to uh, look professional. I haven't figured out the backgrounds and stuff like, uh, like uh, you, you gave and, and, and Joshua. Uh, the, um, I mean, I, I, I would double down everything Joshua just said. The, the reality is that we've gotta be um, uh, innovative. Uh, we, we've gotta be uh, in these historic times and challenges we're dealing with, we, we have to make sure every policy we pass is, is, is inclusive. Um, uh, and we've got to, I, I love the fact that we got, we've got to commit ourselves actually also to be iterative. I mean, we're, we're going to fail sometimes, you know, so the process of just, of, of constantly trying uh, to address the challenge that we have 19th century infrastructure, we have 20th century regulatory and financing tools to address 21st century challenges. And, 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 the, and, the, and the, the energy and the idea and the leadership, and I'm so excited that comes with the Biden-Harris administration and with, with Michael and, and, and now Secretary Pete, he'll always be Mayor Pete, um, um, bringing their leadership to, to DOT is that we finally have the real opportunity uh, to, to build some thoughtful forward-thinking partnerships. And that's at the core of what we're talking about. You know, how, how does open source 
encourage the, the, the collaboration, information sharing, establish our best practices, you know, across all, uh, in, in an intergovernmental way, intersectoral way, public, private, philanthropic, you know, everyone just working together to address some of these really pernicious issues that may have in the old world, that the old world may be mean pre-2020, uh, for some people um, just seem to be um, um, uh, very simple uh, economic issues or, or, or congestion issues. And now I think, I think 2020 has served as a real, uh, uh, real x-ray for so many of us that, that, that uh, of, of the American uh, body and body politic that, 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 that of the pernicious systemic challenges that so many different communities are, are facing. And unless we think very creative and aggressively and aggressively uh, um, um, inclusive and iterative, we're not going to solve these problems. So I'm, I'm excited about, about the feel uh, 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 in, in, the, in, the, in the greater room as to how we're going to work uh, together to address these issues uh, apace and, and, and a way that allows us to hit the ground running. Yeah, no, well said. I feel like another way of saying it was would be like you need to hit rock bottom before you can really, <laughs> really <laughs> Think some 20, of the 20, 20, 2020 was beast mode, man. I mean, you know, um, uh, the uh, night, the greatest pandemic since 1918, the greatest economic disruption, uh, you know, at the certain election year since 1932, and the greatest social unrest, you know, since 1968. You know, yeah. all in 12 months, baby. You know I mean, I mean, I mean it, it, it's amazing the challenges that it, it, it's laid uh, at the floor of, of particularly American cities. And um, and I think um, I, I love the spirit uh, that the, that the Biden Harris administration should hit the ground running, and and and, and the partnerships uh, yeah. I think that, that that are before us as we look at transportation solutions and infrastructure solutions are just downright exciting. Yeah, so well said, and and Michael. So all the pressure's on you. you you're riding in on the white horse, and you're coming in to save all of us uh, from the last year plus. Um, but no, you've had a really interesting ride in your career. Uh, at all levels of, I mean, business, you work in government. What are your thoughts here? Yeah, it's a great question and, and really appreciate the, the comments from, from my fellow panelists and looking forward to get into the, into the details. I think just coming into the Biden-Harris administration, there's obviously a commitment not only to achieving a lot of these principles that we all care about in sustainability, economic growth, safety, equity, and really thinking about transformation and future proofing uh, are, are critical to the president's main priority, which we're turning to after the, the passage of the COVID bill, which is really about how do we build back better. And infrastructure investments in transportation, it's no secret that those are going to be at the core of that. And a question we're continually asked by the White House, by our secretary, as we're thinking through those plans and however they'll go, is kind of like, what are the outcomes that we're buying from that? And what data do we have to really illustrate it? And that's going to require not only federal data and federal efforts and analysis, but extensive partnerships with the private sector and extensive partnerships with cities and local governments who actually have access to that data and are on the ground getting feedback from local communities. You know, our, our secretary at the Department of Transportation is a mayor. He has said he will always answer to the word or to the, to the title of Mayor Pete, even if he's the secretary or something else. And a top priority for him and, and our, our deputy secretary, who's wonderful, Polly Trottenberg, who knock on wood will be confirmed shortly, also comes from kind of city government. So there is a huge focus on thinking about how we can increase the resources of, of city governments, how we can partner with cities to implement important priorities and, and important projects. But as we, as we go down kind of each of those different core principles, you know, whether it's something like responding to the pandemic or, or making a transformational investment in, in American infrastructure, we need better data and we need collaboration to have that data. On things like economic growth, you know, how, can, how many jobs can we create and sustain? But not only that, when we're looking at applying some of the administration's Justice 40 goals, how are we making sure that those jobs are going to um, minorities who have been disadvantaged? How are we kind of diversifying union workforces Getting the right data on that is really important. When it comes to safety, obviously, you know we have great data on uh, you know the the, the many co close to forty thousand traffic fatalities that that happen in the United States every year. But how do we work with cities to attempt to find you know the best approaches to Vision Zero or or, or reducing that? Uh, similarly, on equitable access to opportunity, 
how do we find those communities or, or based on an, an analysis, how do we do a mapping of communities that really are lacking in access to transit? You know, the president set out a goal of every community above 100,000 in the United States having affordable access to zero emission transit. Identifying where those transit gaps means or exist means we can't just do that as an FTA. We have to work with, with cities as well. And, and in things like climate and resilience, you know, we're working with the energy department on, on the president's goal of 500,000 electric vehicle chargers to reduce range anxiety and, and, and continue the transition to electric vehicles. How do you build a type of network? What time, type of chargers do you put where? Are you going to do that in partnership with city governments, with private sector companies that are thinking that it? it requires having the data on the corridors where people travel, where they're dense, where in rural areas you might have range anxiety to make that work. And then on kind of future proofing and innovation, getting data on basic research on things like pavement that can reduce costs, drive greater efficiency. On each of those principles, we don't want to just throw, throw more money at the problem. We want to buy outcomes in all of them. And the president and the secretary of ambitious goals in order to, to know the right outcomes and achieve them, we've really got to, to, to have the kind of best data at our fingertips. Yeah, that was a lot. It was really good. Um, you know, on the transition, we talked about shovel ready versus shovel worthy, which I think is what you're talking about, right? And like buying outcomes is a great way to put it too. And without the data, or without taking a comprehensive look like a landscape assessment across the government, for instance, at electric vehicles and what's needed, you might make some pretty bad decisions. Um, I actually would love to talk to you offline about that. But um, you mentioned economic uh, growth and you know, Mayor Benjamin talked about how tough this last year has been. So drilling down a bit into economic recovery I mean, transportation and, and, and infrastructure, but transportation is really, really important. It's been like shaken to its core this year. Like what's real? You know, is everybody gonna drive a car? Are people gonna get back on, on transit? Um, you know, how do we not only get ready for fall of 2021 and what's gonna happen then, but how do we shape that change? And I'm wondering um, if you guys have thoughts on how we can use data to either react to rapid changes or maybe to drive some positive outcomes. Uh, I, I don't know, Michael, if you, if you have a follow on to that. Yeah, I think the challenges of the past year have, have been immense as, as, as the mayor pointed out. And frankly, a lot of the, that has prompted an internal effort in our administration and, and previously to really gather the best data possible in order to respond to some of that disruption in the transportation system, which was one of the most disrupted, uh, you know, of any of the systems that we saw. So, you know, we get kind of every week from our Bureau of Transportation S Statistics, which is an amazing resource that partners with state and local governments that provides federal data. It's one of the national statistical agencies, a dashboard of how each of our modes are doing in terms of reduced travel, you know, looking at things like aviation traffic is still down kind of 40% since uh, from the pre pandemic baseline. Things like uh, you know roadway travel are still down at, you know as much as twenty percent from that pre-pandemic baseline. Maritime and freight travel have kind of rebounded as you're seeing e-commerce deliveries go through, and we get those updates weekly and monthly, and have tried to use to urge the bureau and, and to urge our statistical agencies to give us that granular data in a much more rapid way, so that we can be targeting a lot of the recovery programs like the ones that were just passed by Congress at the president's urging to um, provide relief for transit agencies, provide relief for aviation, provide uh, you know, support for freight and, and new things like, like aviation manufacturing. You know, I, I think we've also found really useful, again, on this you know, thing about uh, th this theory about like partnership and working with the private sector and local governments, data that, you know, for example, Google has on its local mobility data you know, based on Google Maps has been really helpful in providing kind of real time information data that cities are providing on, on kind of this, you know, everything from public health statistics to transportation statistics or, or transit boardings is really helpful in understanding the challenges and then crafting some of the policy responses that, that you've seen in the American Rescue Plan and that you're gonna to continue to see in, in Build Back Better. Great, and, and Mayor uh, Benjamin, from a, from a mayor's standpoint, you know, what, sure. how, how can we use data to react to these rapid changes? Yeah. 
I'll give it a try, uh, Gabe. And I, I'm, I, you guys remember, I've been a politician for at least 11 years. My parents will say for close to 50 years. Uh, but the, so I'm trying to actually answer the question that was asked. Uh, so um, I'm going to give it a shot. You know, the, uh, the reality is that we have no choice but to make uh, truly data-driven decisions. Uh, we, we have a limited amount of resources that has to be deployed very strategically uh, if, in fact, we're going to try and solve these pressing challenges uh, before us. Historically, a lot of our decision-making uh, at, at all levels of government has, has been made um, not always data-driven. It's, it's sometimes it's, it's been driven by a number of different forces, but oftentimes by emotion and, 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 uh, or, or, or political will or desires on, 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 uh, every, at every level of government. I think the challenge before us now is, is trying to find ways to, um, to, uh, to humanize the data, uh, the, to, to, to use the data to, to weave a, a, a narrative that shows how uh, these uh, specific infrastructure and improvements, the, 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 the common sharing of, of data and, and, and information across city lines and, uh, and, and, and the like, how, how you're using data to make these investments that dramatically improve the lives and create a new, uh, create new economic opportunities for people who, who uh, many of whom, again, before the pandemic, uh, were effectively shut out of the American economic uh, um, uh, mainstream, uh, but using a limited amount of resources that must be data-driven in a way that pulls them back in in a very meaningful way. I think, that, I think there's an opportunity uh, with, with, with having, um, uh, again, a rather porous borders of, of amongst not just our, our, our government layers of government, um, but also um, you know, the amazing um, uh, nonprofits and, and philanthropic and, and, and a significant amount, I might say, of, of, of private sector involvement too, um, some P3s and P4s. Uh, I think we can get a whole lot done, but I think, I think the answer is we've got to be data-driven in how we deploy limited resources. I'm, I'm a public finance lawyer by training, you know, so I, I can tell you how to pay for something. I can tell you how to, how to um, um, uh, issue low-cost debt how uh, defeats that debt over a period of 30 years or 40 or 50 or 60 years. Those decisions now must be made much more strategically than they have been in, in, the, in the past, because there's some decisions, some that I will tell you that different governments are looking at um, uh, investments right now that make no, that may make sense for 2020. They make no sense for 2030 or 2040 or 2050. So how, again, do we start focusing on 21st century infrastructure? And I think the answer to that is uh, our, our solutions have to be data driven. Awesome. Yeah, I, um, I'm really infatuated with this idea of social cost benefit and looking at the 30 year full cost of the investments that we're making. And you got to have data input or you can't you can't make the calculations. Right. And, and also, Mary, you, you talked about collaboration and that being so important between public and private and NGO and and the open source approach to data spec uh, is supposed to do. I mean, that's what it's supposed to do and it benefits agencies and companies by creating that space for collaboration and reducing costs and creating like an ecosystem where hopefully new companies can can plug in so so yasha how do we like bring people together to co-create and or, or or how are you guys doing that yeah no absolutely well i mean i think this this open source model and what we're trying to do at the omf is as you said it's rooted in this idea of having a collaborative space for um you know, both for public and private sector to collaborate, but also for technologists and policymakers to collaborate, because uh, there are often worlds that don't intersect nearly as much as they should. Um, you know, I think there's challenges when you try to do this, right? Public and private sector don't have always have the same priorities. Uh, and in some cases, you know, regulators and the companies that they regulate have very different worldviews. Um, you know, we've adopted the open source model, which is something that comes um, you know, from the sort of technology world, and it's been a really successful way to allow competitive companies to still collaborate with each other in the spaces where they have shared interests. We've brought that into um, data-driven governance and transportation, and we find that some of the same approaches, the focus on consensus, the focus on transparency that allow competitor companies to collaborate in tech also allow private sector and public sector agencies to, to work together, recognizing that sometimes they'll be on opposite sides of the table, but um, there's, a lot that, there's a lot of sort of shared space and you can create a place to, to kind of co-create technology um, for all those folks. 
but but I think it's actually important to talk about why this collaboration is so important because there certainly are benefits about reducing costs and things like that. But I actually think one of the most one of the biggest challenges that faces people in government as we um, have experienced over the last 10 years this incredible growth of new technologies and transportation, new service models. The challenge is, you know, when and how do you regulate, right? Because the risk is, you know, something new comes along and you immediately slap a bunch of rules on it and you kill the thing before it gets a chance to have potentially a very positive or transformative impact on the system. Conversely, if you wait too long, uh, you may lose that opportunity to sort of rein in externalities or, or second order effects that are problematic or to steer the direction of the new technology. And so, you know, what, what we sort of see as this, like, you know, so often this, this conundrum plays out in preemption fights. And it's like, you know, companies will say, well, we can't deal with a regulatory patchwork. So we're just going to do our best to get, you know, the ability of especially local governments to regulate just stripped away. And then we'll have a kind of a clean slate. But when you do that, you lose the actual, you know, regulatory and policy innovation that comes when cities can apply their local values or local priorities to a regulatory landscape and sort of learn, you know, these are the things that we really need to measure with a new transportation technology. These are our equity goals. And we're going to try a couple different policy approaches and see which ones advance those goals or which ones work against them. And you lose that when you preempt. So the model that we have with open standards is to say this, we're going to create a common language for policy, a digital language that allows cities wherever they are to express their local priorities, their local policies in a way that for the companies that are building emerging mobility services is universal, right? They can consume a city policy yeah. in Boston or in Boise, and it's the same technology that gets used, even though Boston and Boise might have very different policies and priorities. Conversely, those cities can get the same data and do their analysis about whether or not you know, the policies and the, the regulatory structure is working. And so it creates a path out of that sort of preemption, we have to preempt and, or deal with a patchwork because you can say, look, you know, yeah, there are there is going to be regulatory variants, but we can make it so that the compliance with those different regulations is a far lower cost and far less complexity. And then all of us collectively can benefit from the ability of local governments to try these different approaches and to measure their impact and hopefully learn from one another about the strategies that actually do advance um, the public interest. And that's really been the model for the mobility data specification and shared micro mobility. We're starting, as, as Angela mentioned, to, um, to expand that into things like curb management and other modes and services like sidewalk delivery robots, where, you know, if, if we're being honest, I think we have to say we have a lot to learn, both public and private sector, about what the right regulatory approach should be. And we want to create that infrastructural layer that allows that to happen. That is going to take some investment, though. We're going to have to actually build the technology that can make that possible. Yeah, but, but it's interesting. You talked about competitors collaborating, consensus, transparency, common language. And uh, these are so crucial. It's really about the relationships and the understanding and getting at the ground level, I think, and, and working together to co-create. And, and I've, I've recruited companies to, to join OMF, as you know, and some of the response, actually almost always the response is, well, I don't think we agree on everything with OMF or with these cities. And I'm like, that's exactly why you want to see the table. This is about creating the dialogue. And so I, I think we're all about that. And uh, this idea of creating something in a black box, public or private, and then springing on everybody is just sort of old school. Um, but you know, one of the conversations that comes up all the time, whether it's about MDS uh, or whether it's about really so many forms of data and data sharing is privacy. It's like the elephant in the room all the time. And so um, I'd love to ask actually, you know, Mayor Benjamin, who I know has thought uh, about this, I was reading an article where, where you were quoted, like what are, what are public agencies doing to protect the privacy of citizens and mitigate risks with data and mobility data? I mean, we've had data for over a hundred years in many of our local governments, right? But for some reason, there seems to be a mistrust of, of local government's ability to manage data. The, um... First of all, I have to tell you, you have to tell me which article you read uh, uh, and, and what, what day that was. Uh, uh, my, my opinions change from Monday to Friday sometimes. <laughs> okay. Indeed. 
Uh, no, but I, I, mean, I, I think generally speaking, um, uh, there there's a distrust um, uh, by citizens and, and, and users of, of, of their information, and, and it's right. It's it's a it's a it's a legitimate concern. Uh, and, uh, um, but I, I I think a lot of the principles that have been articulated uh, that that data will only be used limited data um, uh, access uh, used to obviously improve the public good that we're always going to protect data uh, that we're going to be very pers purposeful and um, uh, in the way in which we use it. I mean, I think again, I think that that that, that trust has built um, uh, over time uh, with with a, with a very clear idea as the um, um, uh, how it's going to be used. But let me say this: I, I do believe clearly that 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 technology, the private sector, technologists, um, uh, a way out here, obviously, on the ideas uh, that will improve uh, uh, our our quality of life, regardless of if it's for profit, not profit, what have you. I believe our citizens are actually way out here as well in, 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 in terms of a, a dot, adoption uh, of these technologies to improve their lives. People are, do, people are pretty doggone bright and crafty and they know how to make things happen if in fact opportunities are made available to them. I do, I do also believe that those very same citizens and, and, um, uh, and residents of our country also realize that we, uh, those of us in, in the public sector, our, our, our governments tend to be way behind. Uh, in term in, in term in terms of, of, of understanding where they are I mean we're, we're, we're still using again uh, practices and, and policies and and probably in their mind uh, maybe even um, security protocols that that, don't, that might not protect their, their data I will tell you it is a constant conversation uh, uh, ongoing uh, going on amongst uh, amongst mayors and other local officials and then the NACTOs is uh, um, I've been leading in, in this space as, as, as well. And I, I think um, I think there'll be less and less of a concern going forward, but but justifiably um, so. Excellent. Yeah. And I have a question actually for um, for Yasha. You know, we have we seem to have different standards uh, or, or or something between what's expected for public and and private uh, uh, privacy protocols. Um, and I'm wondering why do we view them differently, and what are the differences between those protocols, Yasha? Yeah, I mean, I think you know we perhaps do. Although I think this is an issue; these issues of privacy are is something that we're we're grappling with in both the public and private context. Um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, work done uh, by some uh, you know journalists uh, to really look at like what the marketplace for people's you know data about people's movements is and um, you know whether you're talking about public sector use or more often private sector use it's often alarming how sort of unregulated and un, uh, how little introspection has been given to kind of how our individual data is is, is collected and, and tracked in both public and private sector. I mean, I think the bottom line for us though is this, that everyone working with transportation data, public or private has a profound responsibility to make sure that that data is being used for purposes that are um, fair, reasonable, that they are transparent about what data is used for and why it's being collected. You know, many of the uh, many of the transportation services that we've are increasingly coming to rely on couldn't exist without data collection. And so I don't think we look at this and say, well, data is bad, right? But instead we say, well, why? Why are you collecting this? What are you using it for? And I think Mayor Benjamin hit the nail on the head. It's it's really for governments when they're working with mobility data, it's being able to articulate the reason behind that, right? Is it, you know, we are collecting data because we want to measure congestion on roadways and develop strategies to address it. We are collecting data because we want to make sure that a new service doesn't impede travel on the sidewalks and we need to understand if and where that's happening. You know, we're collecting data because, you know, as the in the example that Angela gave earlier in Chicago, we want to make sure that these services are available in an equitable way, right? These are very substantial and legitimate public interests that I think have to be the grounding of any effort on the part of the public sector to work with mobility data that's sort of derived from what individuals are doing. But ultimately there is, even with that basis, there's a real you know, critical need to be responsible and to apply um, you know, good policies, good technical safeguards, um, good practices to how data is handled. 
the OMF and our members have developed a, um, a privacy guide for cities that provides a, a roadmap to some of these, um, you know, these practices that need to happen. Uh, and we're seeing cities, you know, sort of do this work in a lot of ways, both in the mobility space, but frankly, beyond it, because you look at, I mean, I'm a former city CIO, and I looked at the, the breadth of data that the city government sat on from education, criminal justice, housing, healthcare, right? Cities work with uh, incredibly sensitive data on a daily basis. And so building the skills and the practices and the policies to protect it is an essential part of the job. Uh, and it's essential for cities to make those investments in order to be able to maintain the public trust. Um, and that's true in transportation and it's true everywhere else that cities uh, you know, need data to do the work that they do. And, and there seems to be a difference. I mean, there's sensitive data that's historic or real time, but there seems to be a particular sensitivity to, to real time data. Um, this story came out yesterday. I'm just sending it out to everybody on the real-time data available on um, basically every personally owned vehicle in the entire world outside of North Korea. Uh, feel, feel free to check that out. But I think we tend to have these perceptions of what's private and what's public. Um, and then we find out that it's not necessarily as we thought, um, which, you, you know, there's, there's really a, a couple issues there, there to unpack. But I, I did want to ask uh, Michael, uh, sort of a different question, because I'm sure you think about data privacy, but I'm, I'm sure you also think about sort of what is the interesting data that we want to compile. You mentioned bts.gov, which I have to say on the transition, I dove into that pretty deeply and I was like, wow, like this is actually really cool. There's a lot of data here I didn't know existed. And I realized having run two city government uh, agencies and not really knowing much about bts.gov was sort of sad, but maybe it wasn't marketed that well. But it's also mostly historical data. Right. Um, there's not a lot of real time data. So I guess uh, two questions. One is, um, do you plan on doing more with real time data? You want to incorporate MDS data maybe in, into BTS.gov or, or not? And do you worry about uh, uh, privacy when you think about real time data? Yeah, two great questions and I'll, I'll take them in sequence. Um, one of my one of my formative experiences less in the transportation sector but more in um, more in, in, in the recovery work when we were recovering from an economic crisis the last time in, in 2009 was a story about real-time data where for folks who follow the jobs numbers and the GDP numbers that come out of the Department of Commerce and the Department of Labor, it often lags by a quarter. You know, you'll get a, the jobs data lags by a month, the GDP data lags by a quarter, and there are often significant uh, revisions to those data, you know, in the months and years after that. And as the transition and the economic, the, the, the President Obama's economists were designing their original stimulus package, uh, you know, the, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, they were doing it based on Q4 2008 data, the very first data from BEGIN. They, they work really hard. It's an incredible agency. All of these agencies do really good work. But it showed in their first estimate something like a 3% decline in annualized quarterly GDP, which is significant but mm -hmm. not, uh, you know, not necessarily aligned with like a catastrophic recession, even though, you know, you could tell that the economy was in a downturn. A few years later, when there was a full revision with every single data source, this is a typical process that happens, turned out that that quarter, we, we saw closer to a six or 8% decline in GDP. Mm -hmm. Had we known that at the time, there might've been opportunities to say like, look, the recovery act should have been bigger, you know, the, we need to make additional investments and we, we need to kind of go faster. And so it, in the recovery from this crisis, I think having through BTS, through other sources, through the various different both public, private, nonprofit sources about the spread of COVID, often done in partnership with state and local governments and, and the team that Jeff Science has, has stood up, which is really incredible, having access to that real-time data, thinking about the pitfalls of kind of you know, what can happen when you're delayed even by a month or three months has allowed us to shape policy in a way that is kind of of the size and of the speed necessary to respond to that crisis. So BTS data has been really helpful in that. I think, you know, going forward and thinking about accessing more real-time data can help us shape policy more rapidly and more effectively. Privacy though is, is a kind of real concern and I've seen that throughout my career um, in the private sector and in the public sector at the state and local level. 
you really have to start from a position of, of building trust and thinking not only about kind of the hard protections on the data, like who has access to it, but whether the design elements around that data are sufficiently communicating to people what data they're choosing to share or not share. And, and this concept of kind of privacy by design is really important because you might click through, you know, we've all done the kind of click through on a box and I'll share this data. That's not really informing people on some of the trade-offs that they might have by exposing some of their real-time data. So in the private sector, and I think also in the public sector, I, I've always really, I, I've seen what happens when you don't focus enough from the outset on building trust and privacy. You know, most famously worked at Sidewalk Labs where that was a major concern right across the border in, in Toronto for one of the, for a, a kind of flagship private sector uh, uh, smart cities project. And, and the result of that was a, a lot of backlash in the, in the community. So I think, you know, when I've approached projects with transportation agencies in, in, in past lives, and also now at the Department of Transportation, they really do need from the start to adopt robust privacy protections, have kind of thorough reviews of and transparency regarding the purpose and impact of any data collection, and really have best practices on data exchange in the public realm and consultation across a broad range of stakeholders to make sure that data is used in a way that protects privacy, is beneficial to the public, and has kind of open access and APIs that, that you can build a kind of network of innovation on top of that. So that's kind of really critical. And I think, you know, thinking hard about how we can have, whether it's data trusts or public ownership of data or nonprofits and philanthropic entities that are a trusted steward of data, in addition to the public sector and the private sector is, is a really important thing. And I think as a department, we're always looking to collect or, or have access to data in a way that protects privacy, but informs good policy. Awesome, great, thank you. Um, and I think we've got some questions from the audience, so I might uh, dive into those. Um, uh, Tiago O'Brien um, uh, has a question. Will USDOT provide technical assistance and capital so city agencies have more capital to engage and gather data from community members to implement macro goals? Putting you on the spot, Michael, and if you don't know, that's okay too. Yeah, I, want, I will definitely take that back to my colleagues in OSTR and, and DTS. I do think, you know, we're getting into the season of infrastructure proposals, of uh, reauthor surface transportation reauthorization, where Congress is kind of moving on that. And there's obviously a, a set of, you know, a deadline for, for the expiration of transportation bills, you know, towards the end of the year. And our secretary has expressed me and, and quite broadly, a real interest in supporting basic research, supporting state and local governments, supporting access to data that's going to inform strong outcomes-based policy. So I, I will definitely take that back, but I think as we're looking for a lot of the proposals that will flow into the kind of reauthorization and other processes, thinking of how we can partner effectively and, and provide the right kind of technical assistance to state and local governments so that they're making informed policy choices is, is absolutely something we want to work with people on. Great. Um, we've got another question. Uh, Data-driven policymaking creates strong incentives to focus on smart modes like ride hail and scooters. Um, I'm not sure if they meant shared modes, which generate a lot of data. But many impactful interventions for climate and equity are low tech. How do we bring the same enthusiasm for innovation to longstanding infrastructure issues like sidewalks, bus shelters, and bike lanes. I mean, I'll start out by just saying here, here, because uh, that is uh, absolutely true. And we get hung up sometimes on the shiny objects and even the data. And uh, you know, some of the, the solutions we need are uh, connected sidewalk infrastructure and uh, faster bus headways or more regular bus headways. Um, but, um, Mayor uh, Benjamin, do you have any thoughts on that? Like how you balance sort of focusing on these, you know, hot new shared modes versus the basics to meet those outcomes and goals? It's been the story of my life. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a bond lawyer, we finance infrastructure. Uh, so whether it's that boring road or, 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 or bridge or um, uh, uh, water sewer infrastructure. The only the only fun I've ever had is actually uh, we had the uh, first 
um, standalone stormwater um, uh, green infrastructure project in the country, uh, uh, certified green by the Climate Bond uh, Initiative. And my, my citizens got excited about that. Uh, but, okay. but, but some of the fundamental investments uh, that, 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 uh, that are often sometimes funded locally, uh, uh, American cities and, 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 and counties and local governments have never been reticent to make those investments locally. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, some of the excitement that we're hearing and seeing um, um, first through the, um, uh, the ARP, but what we would expect uh, uh, when the infrastructure plan uh, coming through um, uh, Secretary uh, Pete and, and, and Michael and others is we're going to see, I, I think, a significant amount of latitude given to local folks uh, to make decisions that, that, that we can uh, deploy on, on, on the streets. And, that, and I say that because so often um, uh, not only are our, our major infrastructure investments, old school, basic, fundamental, uh, 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 connected uh, uh, streets infrastructure, but also some of the more fancy stuff, we, we, you're usually, we, those conversations are usually, usually held in, in large metropolitan areas. Uh, the focus is there, and, and we're going to be um, pushing, obviously, for a greater uh, uh, emphasis on these basic investments in smaller and mid-sized uh, cities that make it, that make it, make a difference. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not sure how you make infrastructure um, um, sexier, but I will tell you that if you listen to your citizens and listen to your constituents, those are the very basic investments that they want. Um, uh, these ought not be mutually exclusive ideas. In, indeed, if you're thinking long term, we should be thinking about making all of these investments in, in a meaningful way, in a connected way. Excellent. I think that's a, that's yeah. a great point. And that, yeah, I, would just, I mean, I would just add to that, right? I think there's you know, a lot of the kind of more um, untech, non-tech infrastructure type investments, right? They don't necessarily generate data in the way that an e-scooter generates data. And data isn't the sort of only tool that we need to sort of make changes and make investments in these areas. But I do think that, you know, what, what we're frequently seeing with um, you know, with, with what, what data can help us do is it can help us break out of the inertia that we often get into with a lot of traditional infrastructure. I mean, the classic example in any city, right, is street parking, which, um, you know, anyone who has tried to reallocate space that was street parking for a bus lane or uh, a bike lane has experienced the sort of political challenge that that creates, the skepticism, the concern that local businesses have that, you know, this is going to cut into their customers' ability to access those businesses. And, you know, that's a that is a broad conversation. It requires meaningful community engagement. It requires listening. It requires consensus building. But data does play a role in that. Understanding, for example, being able, and not always data coming from vehicles, right? Being able to look at, um, you know, to do an experimental change where, uh, you know, a parking space is reallocated for street dining or a temporary bus lane is put in place and measuring, you can measure in some cases, the direct economic impact of that mm -hmm. on local businesses through sales tax receipts and other forms. So I think that idea of saying, look, rather than fight for years about any change to any piece of infrastructure, let's find ways to experiment, to move quickly, to hold ourselves accountable to actually measuring the impacts of those changes. And hopefully through that, to allow some of these basic infrastructure investments to happen more quickly and more agilely. I think that is a, a mm -hmm. real potential that comes from investing yeah. in the kind of data infrastructure that lets cities um, you know, be uh, more truly data-driven in their approach to all types of transportation systems. Yeah, well, well said. Um, I think we have time for one last question. I think this is gonna be for Michael maybe. Um, to the point around adopting robust privacy mitigation standards, will there be resources provided by USDOT for public agencies to engage in tools like privacy impact assessments, especially when looking to adopt standards for data sharing that include geolocation or geospatial information? Question mark. This is normally best practiced by private companies and not, in, and not inexpensive, but resources and staffing often poses challenges like this for public agencies. Thank you. I'm not sure, Michael, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, it's it's a really good question. And I think that, you know, internally at the Department of Transportation across our modes, there is a process of kind of privacy impact assessment to you used to evaluate the collection of personal data in information systems that they're doing kind of from a government perspective. And the goals of those privacy impact assessment is to determine if the collected personal information is kind of necessary 
and relevant and, and use that PIA to identify and address information when we're planning, developing, implementing, and operating uh, individual information management systems uh, you know, across our modes, whether that's at FAA, thinking about air traffic data, whether that's at things like the FTA and thinking about boarding and, and transit, even things like motor carriers for trucks and, and, and for automobiles as well. So I think it's a question I can take back as to how we can expand some of the lessons learned from what we do at the federal level and making sure that they're you know, flowing through all of our grant recipients and, and flowing to state and local governments as well. Um, but, but making sure we have robust privacy impact assessments and, and kind of a commitment to assessing that and making sure we're doing it efficiently and in a privacy preserving way is, is an important thing we do as, an apartment, as a department and would want to encourage kind of others at, at multiple levels to do. Great, great. And there was a question that we didn't get to, well, it's not really a question for us to answer, but there's a statement about uh, the incredible sales of e-bikes uh, and that that might even be trumping uh, shared mobility. And, and there was actually a great study uh, that just came out. Uh, it was on Twitter this morning about um, private bicycles being actually really crucial. So well said. Um, with that, I think we have a couple minutes left. This has been an awesome panel. I wish we could talk for another hour, but um, I think Angela wants to come back on with some closing uh, statements and thank all of you for participating with me today. This is great. And to the hundred people that came. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Gabe. Um, that was uh, an awesome panel. Thank you um, to Mayor Benjamin and Michael and Yasha for joining us as well. And thank you to everyone who's participated um, as an attendee. Um, if you have any other questions, um, you know, maybe maybe this needs a follow on blog post or something like that. But um, mostly, I just really encourage everyone to stay involved in this work. Uh, we had a lot of great conversation around how we co-create and and the kind of negative impacts of of operating in a kind of black box. Um, and we have the opportunity to uh, to do something different um, with the work that OMF does, um, as well as um, other folks who are working on open standards um, and open source tools. Um, many, many of our attendees are also um, involved in, in that work. So just really want to encourage everyone to stay in touch, um, get involved. You can, um, again, you can find out more information on our website, openmobilityfoundation.org. And thank you so much again to everyone for joining. Um, one last note, uh, this webinar has been recorded, so that will be sent around. Feel free to share with uh, any colleagues who weren't able to make it today. And uh, thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>